five feet, 10 feet is goodbye, Florida. 200 feet is like a uh, global apocalypse. Why are glaciers important, basically? Globally, I mean, for hundreds of millions of people that live around the coast, it's sea level rise. You know, it's because when glaciers melt, all of that water that had been on land and kind of stuck up, frozen, melts, runs off into a river and then goes into the ocean and sort of filling up the ocean a little bit more. But when we look at kind of glaciers as a whole, what's essentially happening with them right now? You know, glaciers are found all over the world, but all across the board, almost without exception, these glaciers are getting smaller and they're getting thinner, mostly on the order of about like one or two feet every year, every single year, year after year after year after year. And it's kind of remarkable how consistent globally, they're all about the same, one to two feet thinner every single year. Why would that be, right? Like, I mean, the world is obviously a big place. There's lots of factors, but why does this seem to be like so clockwork? It's, it's because the, you know, the dominant factor is sort of global temperatures. And even though weather in, a different, in different places is different all over the world, the global air temperatures are getting warmer. And as a result, the glaciers are getting smaller. That means that every single summer, they melt a little bit faster than, than they would if they were actually in balance. When we look at the glaciers, right, like, are they pretty temperature resilient in the sense that like, okay, if they're doing this, this must be really big. Or it's like, okay, these things are sensitive. They change all the time. They're really good, faithful indicators of temperature. So they're very much responsive to temperature. And so if temperatures are getting colder, the glaciers are going to get bigger. And if the temperatures are getting warmer, the glaciers are going to get smaller. And so as you know, over millions and millions of years, as the temperatures on the earth have fluctuated and, and the temperatures have fluctuated in the past, the glaciers get bigger and smaller in response to those changes in global temperature. Now, one of the things that's kind of most uh, interesting, if you'll allow that, is that the glaciers that are getting, they're getting smaller now, but they're getting smaller so much faster than we've seen in the past. And so, you know, you'll hear like, yeah, the earth goes through cycles and yeah, certainly it goes through cycles, but it's, it's really the changes now that are happening that we're seeing over the last, you know, decades that are so much faster than we've experienced or that we have any evidence for of ever happening in the past. And so that's, what's really getting people's attention. That's what's, you know, goes into headlines. I feel like I'm going to ask this in a bad way, but I think you'll understand what I'm talking about in the sense, but like, is there any chance that, okay, we've never really experienced this before, or at least documented it before. Is there any chance that we're seeing these big changes because somebody forgot to carry the one or something yeah. like that? Like, oh, wait a minute, maybe we miscalculated and this is just what happens. That's a great question. And I think that the, the sort of the way that, that science has works that it's so broad and so distributed that everybody is sort of doing their own thing, that if it was a matter of like a math mistake, somebody would catch it really quick. And in fact, there was a, um, a really significant effort. Somebody sort of decided, well, okay, great. I know that NASA is measuring these things. And I know that there are climate centers in the UK that are trying to measure temperatures and glacier changes. Everybody's trying to do this. Maybe they've all got it wrong. So somebody went ahead and they funded a brand new group of physicists with no prior climate experience to say, all right, I'd like you to start at ground zero, start at scratch, and just redo all the calculations. Just like, let's, let's forget it. Let's do it all again. And basically this new group basically came up with the same answers as NASA and NOAA and the UK groups and the European groups and the Australian groups and the Korean groups. All these folks that are doing it and measuring glacier change and global temperature changes, they keep doing it and they keep getting the same answer. So, so no, it's, I mean, it's impossible that this is uh, a mistake. Well, that's good. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. But okay. Yeah. You know, for somebody like myself, right? Like, okay, I get it. This is bad. But I don't really understand how bad it is or why it's so bad. Yeah. Like, yeah. Can you totally. can you so, kind of explain that a little bit? Like, okay, yeah, all right, I get it, but I don't get it. Right, right. So I said at the kind of the kickoff that the biggest sort of punchline for glaciers is sea level, right? And so you've got a certain amount of water on Earth. There's really only just so much water on Earth. And it's either going to be in the ocean or it's going to be on land, right? It serves sort of, some of it gets into the clouds every now and then. And there's groundwater too and aquifers that we, you know, use to drink. But mostly the water is on land or it's in the ocean. And so when you melt a glacier or you melt the Greenland ice sheet or the Antarctic ice sheet, these enormous glaciers, I mean, they're really like uh, Antarctica is the size of um, North Antarctica is half the size of North America. So it's huge. And so when Antarctica gets a little bit smaller, like even though like one or two feet thinner a year, it's that's a huge change when you consider how much ice is getting lost from the land and going into the ocean. And so what this is contributing to is that the overall, all around the world, the ocean is getting, um, you know, it's rising at the rate of about one inch every decade, right? The oceans are rising about one inch every decade. And like, okay, one inch doesn't really seem like that's that big of a deal. But you add this up over, you know, over 100 years, and then you've got a foot. And in some places, depending on the geology or what else is going on, some places are seeing the sea level rise at the rate of about two to three feet every 100 years, right? So, and that's like, that's happening right now. There are places in kind of like the, you know, Western Texas or on the Eastern seaboard in the US that that there are, you know, oceans rising at a, you know, a couple inches every decade. And so the prospect is also that might get worse. And again, if air temperatures warm more, then the glaciers are going to melt faster and that water is going to go into the ocean. And so that, you know, that can be a really significant thing. Right. And then when you think about it, like, okay, so four inches is not that much, but that's the whole planet. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's yeah, a yeah. lot. It's so, a huge amount of water. Do we have any idea, like, okay, if all of the glaciers go, we've got this much more water? I mean, this is a bonkers number. If all the glaciers melt, the oceans are going to be 200 feet taller than they are today. That's basically goodbye, Florida. Five feet. 10 feet is goodbye Florida. 200 feet is like a global apocalypse. The one thing that I've wondered about in this regard kind of is like, okay, so the glaciers obviously contain not just a massive amount of water, but they also are really heavy. So yeah. when, they, when they shrink, like what happens to the land that used to be under all that weight? Yeah, great question. Um, well, the, the land actually does pop back up it's sort of like a little cork or a like a toy boat in the bathtub i've got a little three-year-old and so you know you push your little finger on it and then the boat goes lower and then you if you remove that ice then the land underneath it pops back up and in fact that's actually happening uh in places you know right next to glaciers in alaska where the the um the ocean is actually getting relatively lower because the land is popping up and so the loss of glaciers in alaska actually means l falling sea levels just because the land is rebounding it is it is rising back up as you've removed weight off the top of it that's kind of crazy. Now, I mean, is that just in a, like a small, relatively like localized area yeah. or like, no, no, the whole damn state's going up? No, no, it's it, that's in a relatively um, the, in a relatively local area, like right around the glaciers. Now, because the Earth's shell, its rocky, hard, rigid outer shell is really stiff. Now, when you actually 
it's sort of like a ruler. Like if you can imagine if you push down on one, on the ruler on one spot, it's actually going to pop up in another spot. And so the whole kind of plate, the whole rocky shell of the earth flexes in response to these loads. And so even though Greenland right now is, is getting smaller, right? The Greenland ice sheet is getting smaller and therefore the coast of Greenland is rising. That is actually also compensating with sea levels in say North Carolina, where you've, you've now reduced the weight in Greenland and so that's right. So Greenland is rising, but North Carolina is lowering. It's like a, it's like on a big seesaw. The whole crust is like a seesaw. And so you take the weight off one spot, it rises, but then the other spot further away falls just because it's flexing. The whole sh shell of the earth flexes. Have we figured out all the kind of unintended consequences of this? Or are there more things that like, oh, wait a minute, now this is happening? So there's all kinds of things that can affect sea level. And so sort of flexure is one of them. Changes in ocean currents are another. Um, the, uh, you've got the sort of the, 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 the ice, again, because it's massive, actually, um, has a lot of gravitational force to it. And so the ice actually attracts the ocean to the ice. And so if the ice is getting, if the ice is melting, then it's going to have less gravitational attraction. And then the ocean spreads out away from the former ice sheet. So that is yet another factor, right? So We've got a good handle on, you know, people are kind of digging into the intricacies of this, but the kind of the broad principles of it are, are pretty well understood now. And we can actually, what's kind of remarkable is that, right, so the, I said that the, you know, oceans are rising by about an inch every decade. We can exactly basically parse out of that inch and we can say about a third of that is due to the glaciers melting. About a third of that is due to the shrinking of just the Greenland ice sheet. And about a third of that is due to the warming up of the oceans. The oceans are getting warmer and then expanding because they have more heat in them. You know, warm things expand, tend to expand, cold things tend to shrink. Um, and so, uh, you know, the ocean absorbing heat is actually making sea level rise a little bit. Is there any, is there any like positive signs or good signs that like, okay, but we got this going for us. The amazing and the positive thing is that, you know, if you still want glaciers and you want to reduce coastal flooding, the amazing thing is that the transition away from things like oil and gas and coal is happening way faster than anybody thought was possible a decade ago, right? Every, you know, we've had solar panels and wind turbines for a long time, but the rate at which they're getting adopted now is unbelievably fast. It is now, there's more new electricity generation from those renewable sources, from those brand new technologies than from any of those kind of the old 20th century uh, resources. And it's now cheaper if you're going to run a power plant it's cheaper in most places to do it by installing a solar panel network or set out an array of wind turbines than it is to build a new coal plant. So it's actually, even if you don't care about glaciers, just follow the money and do the right thing for the planet by getting away from those old resources. So the rate at which people are switching um, is just so much faster than we thought. Now, we need to do more of that, but we're headed in the right direction. And the worst things that we thought were going to happen a decade ago, like a decade ago, you may have heard about like the Paris Climate Accords or, you know, these different kinds of big international bodies that get together. And about a decade ago, they really thought like, okay, well, we're really effed. 
Like we're we're making terrible decisions. Everything is in, headed in the wrong direction. And in that last decade, people are starting to turn the wheel and get away from those worst outcomes. Now we need to keep turning, right? We need to keep pulling on those levers. But you know the worst things that were seen possible a decade ago are no longer on the table because of technology and engineering and you know economics That's, isn't that funny in the sense like we need to do this to save ourselves nah we need to do this because we can make some money oh okay yeah right, <laughs> right we'll do that yeah. hey but whatever I mean, works that, i mean isn't that so much better like you don't even have to worry about people's values everybody values having money in their wallets right right so let's follow that decision right right like i oh, are doing the planet you can make 10 bucks oh well then let's go uh, ahead yeah and, Whatever works for it. Kind of shifting a little bit away from the climate change stuff. Um, yeah. When we talk about a glacier, like is a glacier just a glacier? Or is there like other parts of the glacier? Like when I imagine it, it's like, all right, that's the glacier. Yeah. But what's kind of in the glacier? We make a distinction between valley glaciers or cirque glaciers, or Piedmont glaciers or ice sheets, ice shelves. I mean, all these kind of terminology jargon stuff. But it's really all ice formed from snow that moves, right? That's what a glacier is. And so some of these ice sheets, you know, the, like the An Antarctica or Greenland ice sheet, which are, you know, continental scale, are just really big glaciers formed from snow that move. Now, the movement is one of the things that I am particularly fond of. I mean, that's really where, that's kind of what, how I got into glaci glaciers into studying glaciers. And that's what a lot of my research is on, is trying to figure out what makes them move. And, you know, when I was first getting into this, I actually thought that glaciers, I mean, that studying glaciers would be like watching an ice cube on your kitchen counter melt. I was like, really? Like studying glaciers? You know, it gets hot, it melts. What more do you need? <laughs> yeah. But, but the movement is wild. And so glaciers are always going a little bit faster, going a little bit slower. And most glaciers, on average, are moving about like 300 feet every year. They kind of flow downhill, down the mountain, about 300 feet per year. So that's like one foot every single day. It's kind of like a remarkable thing that like, you know, they're really chugging. Now, sometimes in the winter, you know, glaciers will move a little bit more slowly. In the spring, in the summer, they'll move a little bit faster. And then there are some glaciers that, call, that we call them surge type glaciers because they'll go 10 or 100 times faster all at once. And so one of the glaciers that I'm studying actually moves up to 100 feet in a day. Like it's, it's, that's a huge amount of motion, right? But then this glacier all of a sudden will just kind of like shut down, right? So it'll surge and it'll do this 100 feet a day for a period of like a year and a half, two years, and then shuts down, like close for business, nothing doing for another five years, 10 years, 30 years. And then all of a sudden, a switch goes again. And the glacier all of a sudden starts rocking and along again, right? What did, what'd you figure out? Like, have you figured, have you figured anything out? Or like, well, we don't know yet. It's these glaciers, so, so glaciers move faster when you add water to them, right? And so, but only when you add the water. If you keep adding the same amount of water, then the glacier can evolve and adjust to handle and transport that water. So there's actually a lot of liquid water mixed in with the ice. And so, right, I mean, if you go visit a glacier, say, Mount Rainier, or you go to the Alps or something like that, or you just, you know, we watch a movie about a glacier. What you'll see on the top is, you know, hard ice and snow. But underneath these glaciers, there's all tons of water. And that water, how much there, how much water there is, and where that water is, and how does that water flow underneath the glacier, like through a almost like a set of like arteries, like, you know, the arteries in my body, there's a whole set of arteries and plumbing underneath the glacier that moves the water. And so some of that water, if that water gets stopped up and stuck underneath the glacier, then 
you can sort of build up the water pressure underneath the ice and then cause the glacier to really start to flow a lot faster. And so some of these glaciers just are in a real sweet spot where they're not able to get rid of all of that water. And then that leads to something like a glacier surge. How is there water underneath the glacier? Like, but wouldn't that, why wouldn't that freeze? It's like the ice cube in your water, right? If you stick an ice cube in, a, in your water, right, initially, that ice cube is going to start to melt. But as it's melting, it's going to make, it's going to cool down the water until your water, your glass of water and the ice cube are both at exactly the same temperature. And at that point, at that freezing point of water or the melting point of ice, then the water and the ice can exactly coexist with oh. no freezing or melting taking place. And there you can have an ex a perfect mixture of ice and water simultaneously. Like I get it as long as I don't think about it. That's one of the things that you're like, okay, well, how, what's the temperature of this ice, right? Is this ice, right? It's obviously it's frozen, but is it, is it a lot colder than freezing? Is it, you know, so like, you know, freezing point of water, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Is that water, is that ice really like 20 degrees Fahrenheit? No. We know that it is exactly at 32 degrees Fahrenheit because we see both water and ice coexisting. And therefore, it is at exactly 32 degrees Fahrenheit, exactly the freezing point of water. So when the glacier moves, does it move like, all right, the whole thing moves? Or is it like, okay, this part goes and this part goes? It's a combination of both, actually. So the whole thing you'll get. You know, if you think about like a column of ice, the entire column of ice will be moving over the rock and sediment below it, just like uh, like an ice uh, an ice cube uh, sliding over sandpaper, right? The whole ice cube moves over the sandpaper, and the whole thing stays as a block. But given long enough, and given enough sort of stress, right? Given enough kind of gravitational force, the ice itself actually changes its shape like molasses or honey, and it flows over the top of itself as well. So it's also kind of creeping to kind of like fill in any gaps. It's, it's um, like, you know, like motor oil. It's this like viscous sludge that is just oozing down the mountains. And so glaciers move through both of these two different ways simultaneously by moving as a block, like the ice cube over the sandpaper, and also the kind of oozy sludge where the top of the glacier is going to flow a little bit faster than the bottom of the glacier just because it's slipping oh, over see. the sort of the layers of ice beneath it. As they move, are they kind of like, okay, it's taking everything in its path with it. Like, it's going to destroy anything in front of it. Or can they be susceptible kind of to the environment around them? You know, they do rip down mountains. And there's a whole fascinating uh, way to think about mountain building where a mountain range will grow, 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 grow until it gets high enough. And then you can start to form a glacier on top of it if it gets high and cold enough. And then the glaciers, because they are so effective at eroding and ripping out and tearing out rock, they will rip out the rock and keep the mountains from going any higher. And so there's a, this, uh, this idea is called a glacial buzzsaw, right? Where you, you keep the plate tectonics are pushing up the mountains, but then you get the mountains get tall enough that the glaciers start to just, just keep ripping off the tops of those mountains so that the mountains can grow no taller, right? So maybe part of the, you know, you want to know, well, why are the Himalayas high and maybe no higher? It's because of the glaciers. The glaciers are actually preventing and ripping out rock to keep the mountains from getting any taller. Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of looking worldwide, is there one glacier or a couple of glaciers or an area that glaciologists are looking at and being like, 
that that's going to be the signal for everything else. There are a few, especially big glaciers that seem to be especially sensitive. And so one of those glaciers is called the Thwaites Glacier. It's in Antarctica. And it's, it's a real, I mean, it's uh, the glacier itself is about 60 miles wide, right? So one glacier that's 60 miles wide, and then it, it kind of flows up into the interior of the ice sheet, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles. Like it's a monster big glacier. And it seems to be melting uh, from below due to kind of warm ocean water, right? So this is a glacier that is formed on land but it gets down to the ocean. The warm ocean water seems to be melting that. And this is a glacier that seems to be changing especially fast. And that part of Antarctica is shrinking a lot faster than the other parts of Antarctica. And so that's one glacier that people are really like, uh, it has the potential to go a lot faster than it is even now. And folks are really watching that very carefully to the point that actually the US and the UK a few years ago said this is so important that we want to you know team up make like uh you know uh the avengers or something like that there's some kind of like superhero team of of get everybody together and let's really make a big push to understand how thwaites works how this one glacier really works and so they sent a big ship down there and some helicopters and Lots of scientists to all really make a whole bunch of different measure measurements to try and better understand how Thwaites Glacier works. Did we do we did we figure it out? <laughs> do we know? Yeah, people are trying to better understand. Okay, are there sort of tipping points or thresholds where you're like, uh, okay, if the glacier melts just a little bit too much, then then we're going to go into a big kind of a uh, a big sort of feedback of 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 changes that that we can't really control anymore. Is there kind of a tipping point in the sense that like, look, if we cross this, it doesn't matter what we do. Uh, there are tipping points and Thwaites is one of the glaciers that has one of these tipping points. Now, there's still too much, unfortunately, that isn't known about the intricacies of how glaciers work to say exactly where that is, to say, all right, tomorrow, that's it you know, we're going to get there, you know, we don't exactly know if the threshold is going to, you know, what that threshold looks like. Yeah, we kind of know there is a tipping point. We just don't know where and when. Yeah, exactly. Is is there anything that we can do in the sense, like, is there any research looking into things like, okay, not just kind of reducing the impact of climate change, but like, if we buy these really big fans or like anything kind of a technological means that like, okay, we can do this and we can take care of this. I mean, certainly by far the easiest and most surefire way to stop the glaciers from melting is to stop heating up the air, right? That like, that's, you know, and, and we said that even makes economic sense. Now, one of the interesting things is that people are also trying to figure out like, all right, is there something, is there a way, like you're saying, that we can engineer the glaciers to make them not melt as fast? And so in just two weeks, actually, I'm going to a little workshop um, to better, that's focused on sort of glacial geoengineering, right? Is there a way that we can uh, cool down the bottom of a glacier? Right? Can can we make it freeze onto the rock and sediment below? Can we can we pump water out of the bottom of the glacier? Can we reduce the way at, or the rate at which the hot, warm ocean gets in and circulates underneath these ice sheets and is melting the ice from below? Right. So people are glaciologists are trying to figure out if there is something feasible that we could do to like better anchor these glaciers in place. Um, but right now it's still kind of very much in this sort of the realm of sci-fi. Uh, you know, is it possible? I don't know. The one thing, I don't know anything about this, but the one thing that has always kind of interested me is like, okay, so there's all that weight and that pressure. How does that not create the enough heat to then melt the ice? Right. Yeah. Cause I think of like the core of the earth, right? Like that's all the heat from the pressure, but like, how does that, how does a glacier get around that? 
So that does actually happen. Now, the rate at which that happens is really, 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 really tiny. And this exists underneath the sort of, you know, the Antarctic ice sheet, right? Antarctica is two miles thick of ice. Uh, and that is, you know, that's warming up the ice underneath it. And so that's part of why, even though the top of the Antarctic ice sheet could be like negative 40, like the coldest temperatures ever experienced on Earth, but the bottom of the ice sheet is at exactly 32 degrees. Is there any chance that we may be exposed to like new organisms or diseases or things as these start to melt? Like, have you ever found like, oh, that's not, that's weird. It seems very unlikely. Now, that people are drilling through some of these glaciers. There was a project in Antarctica um, maybe five, ten years ago where they drilled through the glacier into a lake below the glacier. There was actually like a pond, a lake underneath the ice sheet, like of liquid water. And so they drilled into that and sucked up a little bit of that water really carefully. And then, you know, brought it to a microbiologist and said, what's in here? And, you know, there were marine, you know, microorganisms, like stuff that lives in the ocean, stuff that is, you know, totally like there was really life underneath the ice and it was trapped there underneath the water now they didn't discover any you know michael Crichton, you know stuff like any kind of uh secret viruses or unknown bacteria but um you know when you when you look with a new set of eyes sometimes you find new things can you kind of explain like okay so what's happening right now we're watching a glacier yep. what is it called yeah, so this is called iceberg calving. And so this is another thing. This is another one of my areas of research, actually, is to how do glaciers that flow into the ocean break apart? And sometimes they break apart more quickly or sometimes they break apart less quickly. And so this is a glacier in Greenland called Jakobshavn Ispray or Jakobshavn Glacier. And this is a glacier that flows into the ocean and it is uh, about uh, two to 3,000 feet thick Good right God. here. And so, um, you know, we're talking like top of the Empire State Building or top of the Space Needle, like, you know, make, dwarfing those elevations, right? So this glacier, thousands and thousands of feet thick. And it, when it breaks apart into the ocean, some of those blocks break apart um, intact. And so they are a 3,000 foot tall column of ice that then sort of slowly rotates over and, um, and it sort of slowly capsizes. And so we're watching here a piece of the glacier that is broken, cracked, and then capsized into the water. And you see, you know, water pouring off of this stuff. You know, these things, these events, some of these calving events can take, you know, 10 minutes for this to happen. And you're just watch and watch. And I, I was lucky enough to see this in, in Greenland myself a few years ago. But you're you almost it's happening so slowly that you're like, is there even anything happening? But it's, you know, miles away. It's right. It's miles away from these cameramen. And it's at such a huge scale that it happens. You know, a second to second, you can barely notice, but over 10 minutes, you're like, oh my God, that's like, you know, the size of a city, like the size of a city just like flipped over, creating this monster wave. Man, I would get the hell out of there. Oh, yeah. So what's with the color, right? Like, well, how does it, why does it have that color of kind of like that dark? bluish glacier ice is white because there's so many like Dang you God, get so this. many some of these um you get these air bubbles in the ice as the ice starts to break down and those air bubbles are just the right size that um that they kind of reflect and they scatter the light back in all directions and at all different wavelengths and that's what makes glaciers look white from above now 
in some of those images, what we were seeing was glacier ice that had just broken and um, had just fractured and it had not begun to melt at all in the least. And so that ice um, didn't have any air, air bubbles in it, didn't have anything to scatter all of that light back at our, our eyes. And because it didn't have those scatterers, it looked, it didn't look white. It looked really dark blue because instead of the getting scattered by the air bubbles, it gets kind of um, that light gets to penetrate deeply into that ice. And as it's going, as it's penetrating into that ice, all of the kind of the red wavelengths, the red part of the spectrum and the orange and yellow part of the spectrum, that all gets absorbed by the ice. And what ends up getting reflected back then is the unabsorbed light, which is the blues, right? This is sort of why, why you know, if you swim to the bottom of a swimming pool and kind of look up, all of the sunlight looks kind of bluish, you know, right? This is why water looks blue to us is that, that the reds are getting absorbed the blues end up kind of reflecting some reflecting back at our eyes. That's pretty much all the questions that we got. Is there anything that you think that we missed or kind of how can people learn more? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of work um, out there trying to figure out how glaciers work. Um, you know, I think that the, the keys are glaciers are, you know, glaciers are awesome. They're beautiful. They, you know, affect their ecosystems. They move. And, you know, and they melt, unfortunately. And so I think one of the ways that there's a lot of um, a lot of kind of media coverage now, you know, um, that about, you know, how how these glaciers are changing. And so kind of just keeping an eye on that would be great.